Okay. I think we have pretty much uh, a good quorum of, of, of attendees now. Again, my name is Paul Fagan. Welcome I'm from the McCain Institute. And we're very happy to be hosting this event today, Countering Authoritarianism's Use of Disinformation, The Road Ahead in 2021. Um, we're very pleased to, to have everyone here. Um, I'm going to, before I introduce the panelists, um, I'm going to turn it over to, to my boss and executive director of the McCain Institute, um, Ambassador Mark Green, who will give some opening remarks, and then uh, we'll turn it over to our panelists today. Mark, over to you. Great. Uh, thanks, Paul. Hello, everyone. And thanks for everyone, uh, to everyone for joining today's event with Internews and the McCain Institute. As Paul said, uh, I'm Mark Green. I'm the executive director of the McCain Institute and a great fan of Internews and its vital work all around the world. So today's conversation will focus on how authoritarians are harnessing misinformation and disinformation to undermine democracy and freedoms all around the world. Now, the broad playbook that authoritarians are using really isn't new. Manipulating elections, quelling political opposition, crushing civil society, jailing journalists all around the world. And yes, we should approach this topic with some humility. The use of disinformation is obviously not limited to classically authoritarian regimes. Non-governmental actors, even in a society that prides itself on liberty and freedom can weaponize information or pieces of information in ways that produce serious and sadly sometimes deadly consequences. The US Capitol is a shrine to freedom and democracy and it was besieged in ways that could not have been possible without the raging fire of sinister misinformation. The events and the misinformation leading up to the attack are not totally dissimilar to some of the ways that authoritarians have manipulated truth abroad to incite violent action for their own benefit. So as I said moments ago, misinformation and the ends to which it is applied is hardly new. But the speed, the power, and the reach of the tools increasingly being applied, well, that is a more recent creation. Through social media platforms, forces opposing democracy and rule of law can more quickly reach a broader audience with few, if any, filters on what's being said. Now, in response to this, many tech companies have enacted temporary solutions on their own platforms to mitigate some of the damage that misinformation can cause if left unchecked. On the world stage, these are the times when the combination of a pandemic, rising authoritarianism and lingering conflict are creating more displaced, more vulnerable communities than ever before. Misinformation all too often makes them scapegoats and fodder for extremism. They are sometimes targets, sometimes an excuse for authoritarian moves. However, we can push back on this trend. Remember, authoritarians usually turn to purposeful misinformation, not because they are strong, but because they are weak. They fear truth and knowledge because they fear an informed citizenry. And all of that means that we need to reaffirm and reinforce the role of independent media like never before. Activists, journalists, opposition politicians, everyday citizens are countering the malign influence of misinformation from the streets of Hong Kong to the subway of Minsk, Belarus. Truth and knowledge can and will prevail. I hope you find today's conversation thought provoking and can apply many of the solutions discussed today to your own consumption of, of information and in the work that you do. We are excited to partner with Internews and my, I would say old friend, Jeannie Burgo, but that's a bad way of putting it, my longtime <laughs> friend, Jeannie Burgo. And we have a great panel of experts who can speak to a diverse range of perspectives and on a broad range of issues and fronts. So thanks again to everyone. And with that, I'll pass it back to Paul Fagan, who will introduce our great panel. Paul, back to you. Thanks so much, Mark. I really appreciate you framing today's discussion. Um, I think your, your words certainly um, bring what's happening locally here in the United States to a global 
um, situation as well. So thanks again for your for your opening remarks. With that, I'm going to introduce our panel um, because I want to get this this conversation started. And I know a lot of people have joined us today. First, we have Jeannie Birgo, as Mark said, a longtime friend of of Mark's, but also the the human rights and democracy field. Um, she is the CEO of Inner News. Second, we have Rocky Cole, who is from our, our partner from Google slash Jigsaw, um, a lead researcher there on, on the issue. And finally, we have Enrique, Enrique uh, Gascio Zorro um, from Confid Confidencial uh, reporting from Nicaragua. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jeannie and then we will uh, hear from Rocky and Enrique uh, in that order. And then we will start our moderated discussion. So uh, Jeannie, over to you, thanks so much. Great. Great, uh, thank you so much, Paul, and thank you, Ambassador Green, for your opening comments. Um, Ambassador Green ca captured the, the, the big influences of disinformation, so I just wanted to start out by diving a little bit deep into two, two issues. One is, is the really significant impact that disinformation is having on elections all around the world. In Freedom House, Freedom House conducted an assessment of 40 elections that were held from between mid-2018 and mid-2020, and they found out that 88% of these were marred by what they called digital election interference. This ranged from you know, the ultimate internet shutdowns, but all the way to massive disinformation campaigns. And if you think about election disinformation, it can be coordinated bot campaigns, deceptive political advertising, a disinformation spread through messenger apps, manipulated viral videos, troll farms, everything. But the hard truth is, we do not expect to see any contemporary election that is not marred by disinformation in the coming years. And then there's COVID. Getting accurate information out about a new, rapidly changing, frightening disease was never gonna be easy, but it's all the more difficult when disinformation is coming from those in power, those in charge of helping us do this. And we have governments around the world who have a vested interest in shifting blame or shirking responsibility for what's happening with COVID around the world. And COVID itself has caused other problems and really silencing dissent around the world. We saw at the beginning of the pandemic, a collapse of large scale protests, uh, which has changed over time. And we saw the success of Black Lives Matter this summer, but certainly people are less inclined to get into large groups. We see a direct impact on journalists and the, their own safety at risk as they do their reporting, which is hindering their ability to hold power to account. Lockdowns themselves have had a toll in political participation and lockdowns have gone very extreme in some places, including as, as, as bad as in the Philippines where lockdowns are, they threaten lethal enforcement if you break a lockdown. Authoritarians are really exploiting the fear of this disease and they call, a number of them are calling for states of emergency, which includes crackdowns on a free press in places like Hungary and Egypt. And tragically, such crackdowns result in more COVID deaths in countries that have large outbreaks, such as Venezuela. And that is the trend that we're seeing so dramatically in 2021. And Mark alluded to the fact that disinformation has been around for a long time in the form of propaganda. But disinformation in, in, in this era has changed a lot because of the media, because of the speed. And that actually gives a couple of factors that give authoritarians uh, a step up in their successful use of disinformation. So the first of those Mark alluded to is, is social media itself. Social media um, platforms, we find that disinformation is inherently more successful than the earnest truth. Social media monetizes based on engagement and inauthentic behavior, this is inflammatory speech, ranging from inflammatory speech all the way to, to simple clickbait, has proven to have a measurable advantage in the engagement department over good solid information. And the second factor that authoritarians have in their favor is us. Human psychology is part of the problem. Research has also shown that we like content that reinforces our views and biases. One study of Twitter showed that a false story reaches an audience of 1,500 people six times faster on average than an accurate one. So we've got a few things stacked up against us. But if we wanna to move to solutions, which is what I wanna focus on, we need to think about what the ultimate goal of authoritarians are right now when they think about using disinformation. In the old days, propaganda often was pushing a specific message to a population. In the current days with disinformation, the goal is more to sow confusion to the point where citizens distrust everything. They distrust core democratic institutions 
it undermines democracy itself. And so that sort of understanding the focus of what authoritarians get out of disinformation helps us think through those solutions. And so at Internews, we really focus on five approaches to fighting modern disinformation. The first has been a go-to um, that, that rose within this modern age is fact-checking, fact-checking desks at media outlets, fact-checking organizations, and they've all become an important part of the news landscape. Second are digital and media literacy programs, which target people and our ability to make informed judgments about the content we see, the content we share, the content we amplify. A third approach is algorithm accountability, which focuses on the role of the technology platforms. It looks at their terms of service. It looks at their role in amplifying certain content or moderating other content, how they mitigate disinformation or dangerous speech, looking at all those different issues. A fourth approach we're calling dis disinformation reporting or investigations. This is how media or other players can responsibly document disinformation and build sort of an archive of this disinformation, which could aid in the future for building a basis, a legal basis for holding bad players to account in the disinformation landscape. And finally, there is a strong case to be made for the, the cornerstone of countering bad information is investing in good information, good, accurate, fact-based journalism at the root. Now, Internews, we engage in all five of these approaches, um, but today I want to end on that final one because it's the one I love the best and because it has the significant value of rebuilding trust uh, in a public institution. And rebuilding trusted information is hard, but not impossible. And we can talk about the hows in the Q&A later, but I want to talk about two really important lessons that we've learned on building trust in media are. First is you need to focus on local, start local. Local media in local languages from local trusted voices are the most important place to start. Studies show that local media is the most trusted media in the United States and all around the world. And this supports the saying that you often hear, people don't trust the media, but they do trust their media. The second is we need to encourage media as much as possible, our local media partners, to engage with their communities. People trust voice people, people trust institutions that speak directly with them. People trust institutions that listen to them. Top-down messaging from unfamiliar sources does little to rebuild trust, whether you're trying to promote vaccines or you're trying to cover transparent elections. So I believe that rebuilding trusted local media is the essential building block for all the other four approaches we have to countering disinformation globally. And I look forward to our conversation so we can explore this further. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeannie. Thanks for that, uh, that introduction to your, to your topic. Um, we're gonna turn it over to Rocky Cole, who's from Jigsaw, which is a unit of, of Google. But you know, Rocky, you can explain a little bit more about what Jigsaw actually does um, um, uh, in, in, you know, collectively. So I'm gonna turn it over to Rocky. Yeah, well, uh, thanks. And uh, hello to everyone out there. And a special thanks to uh, the McCain Institute for the opportunity to have a conversation today. Really appreciate it. Um, just to situate us, um, Jigsaw is an independent unit within Google, um, previously an alphabet company, now back under the Google umbrella. And our mission is to explore threats to open societies and build technologies to inspire scalable solutions across a range of issues, including um, violent extremism, toxicity, and harassment, free expression, and my neck of the woods, uh, mis and disinformation. And I happen to be a researcher and I've been focused for about the last two years or so um, on solutions to misinformation. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that solutions are, are top of mind um, to other panelists. Uh, as you might imagine, I've, I've learned um, through trial and error <laughs> that there are no silver bullets uh, to this problem space. Um, but on the other hand, there are nonetheless a range of things we, we can do to counter misinformation. Um, and unfortunately, um, also equally as many challenges, frankly. So what I thought I'd do, um, just really to kick off the conversation and, and the spirit of being um, solution oriented, is walk through kind of a sampler, if you will, similar to how the previous panels did um, about the general type of work that's being done specifically in the technology world, um, you know, acknowledging that you know, misinformation is 
a societal problem as much as a as a technology problem. But um, you know, being the technologist in the room, I thought I'd, I'd limit my remarks to that scope and then highlight kind of some of the challenges of each area, but also some of the exciting developments. And then maybe in the Q and A, if anything is particularly interesting, we can circle back. So also similar to uh, the, the last speaker, uh, I have some buckets that I want to walk through. Um, and the three buckets are basically this information online. The first bucket is um, actually quite similar to one that was mentioned earlier, which is just providing high quality content to users. Um, the second bucket is countering malicious actors. And the third bucket is giving users more context. Um, on the first bucket, uh, this largely means two things. Um, first, supporting journalists. Um, and second, ensuring that their work is surfaced and seen by users. Um, while it's not nearly enough, um, technology companies have given, you know, probably billions of dollars at this point in grants to journalism initiatives and journalists over the last few years. Um, and that's not going to change anytime soon. In particular, I've you know, we're now turning our attention to um, local news investments, um, which I, I agree is, uh, is really important. Um, and likewise, I, I think technology companies have done an increasingly better job, I'm not going to say, you know, perfect, um, of surfacing authoritative information from um, journalists and other authoritative sources on topics vulnerable to misinformation. And that work needs to continue and grow. Um, but, you know, on the flip side, and some of these things have already been mentioned, and I, I don't need to belabor them, um, there's kind of a fundamental scale problem at the moment with journalism. Um, first, you know, there are just more lies out there at the moment than quality, quality journalists, <laughs> and it's hard to keep up um, with the bad actors. It's a bit of a game of, of whack-a-mole, and I think this is particularly true in sort of non-US, non-Western European areas, as we'll hope, I'll probably hear from um, in a moment. And likewise, you know, as was previously mentioned, trust in journalism is at a bit of a low point. And if that trust continues to erode, um, you know, largely because of concerted efforts by malicious actors to erode that trust, then I think people might still gravitate towards the dark side, if you will, even if the economic situation were to stabilize. Um, so the second bucket, uh, countering malicious actors, um, I think largely involves setting and enforcing policy regarding what's acceptable behavior online. Um, it's no secret that malicious actors go to great lengths to reach their audiences, and they're constantly seeking new and innovative ways to manipulate media. And in this space, I think the challenges are also twofold. Um, one, similar to the problem of journalism, just staying ahead of the bad actors. You know, a lot of the a lot of these actors are you know state states, stealthy state actors. Um, who are, you know, have a lot of money to throw at the problem. And, but others are, are smaller actors, you know, like malicious PR firms who are just quite nimble. And it's really easy for them to stay ahead of the good guys, if you will, um, if you want to call people on one side the good guys. And uh, I think the second uh, challenge is just ensuring a diversity of voices in who gets to decide what's permissible online. You know, should it be large private sector entities, um, governments, citizens? You can imagine there are a lot of trade offs here. Um, and I'm not really an expert in this area, so I'm, I'll probably leave it at that, even in the Q&A, but I wanted to include it for the sake of completeness. And the last bucket, giving users more context, is really my bailiwick and area of expertise. Um, and one premise of, of most of my research uh, is that misinformation will always exist online in some form or another, um, largely for the reasons I mentioned above. Um, and you know, for that reason, we really need solutions that go beyond um, just policy and elevating authoritative voices. Um, and another premise, um, which I led with, is that misinformation is as much a real world, you know, offline problem, offline societal problem, rather, um, as it is an online problem. And so I think that means there's a clear role here for the average citizen to play in countering misinformation. Um, and it's certainly central to at least Google's mission to help users find highest quality information and give them the tools to do that. Um, but there are a lot of challenges in this area too. The biggest being that the science of why people engage with misinformation um, over the truth, as the, as the previous panelist uh, mentioned, is really underdeveloped. And we've only recently started to unwrap the cognitive and behavioral processes associated with these behaviors. Um, the early research suggests that it's really, really hard to dislodge misinformation once it gets into your mind, um, especially when there's an element of extremism um, or conspiracy to it. 
So I think what that really means is there's a lot of work that needs to be done here to create new tools, new user experiences, um, new digital literacy approaches, new treatments, if you will, like you know online treatments, um, to help users avoid misinformation in the first place, meaning like before it becomes like lodged in their mind. Um, and that this can range from you know activating uh, critical analytical thinking to training users to spot common um, techniques that are used to manipulate audiences um, to uh, even uh, simpler things like figuring out how to write the perfect fact check, if you will. I think you know we can get into this later, but there's uh, even just within fact checking, there's a whole debate on like what's the most effective way to fact check and does it even work at all and all these things, right? So I think we're just getting started in this space and um, there's a lot of really exciting things happening here. Uh, and I look forward to going uh, deeper in the q and I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much, Rafi. We like this, these different perspectives, you know, uh, I think, you know, with Jeannie, she's giving a very global perspective, you know, being with Inner News and, and Rocky, you know, your experience as a researcher at Jigsaw and, and you know, at Jigsaw and your experience in the in the the national security um, realm is really is really helpful, um, but I think not but but now we have Enrique um, from Nicaragua can who can bring sort of this local perspective local you know a journalist perspective, um, and how mis and disinformation really impact facts truth in, in reporting, um, as we keep on going back to this issue around local media and trust in media, um, Enrique I think can give us a a, a real um, you know, idea of, of what it's like to be a journalist, you know, in, in a small country like Nicaragua, but, you know, as it, you know, I think it also is a, is a sort of maybe a microcosm of what we all are facing when it comes to, um, you know, journalism these days. So Enrique, over to you. Thank you, Paul, Jeannie, Rocky, and especially to our audience. Um, I'd like to start uh, by emphasizing a point that Ambassador Green made at first, and it is that we must continue to enrich the debate this information and more broadly, the communication and information ecosystem as a political and social battleground is not new in Nicaragua or elsewhere. The Somosas, for example, exploited mass media to uphold their authoritarian project between the 1930s and 1979. The Sandinistas used radio to build favorable public opinion for an armed uprising in the 1970s. In 1979, Somosas National Guard murdered US correspondent Bill Stewart his camera operator captured the execution, smuggled the tape out of the country, and it was seen around the world. This unfolded like viral videos of repression caught on smartphones nowadays. The US abandoned Somoza after decades of partnership and shortly thereafter, he was overthrown. Then propaganda and censorship became a mainstay of the Sandinista regime in the 1980s. The use of mass media to influence public opinion and behavior has been part of Daniel Ortega's strategies while he sowed chaos to rule from below when he lost power in the 1990s, while he built a soft dictatorship with complicity from economic power holders and a largely acquiescent public between 2007 and 2017, and also while he established an all out police state in response to the mostly nonviolent massive uprising of April, 2018. We must consider that technology may have changed the pace and scope of this phenomenon, but perhaps not its essence. And why is this so important? Because without insights on how and why conflict unfolds in communication and information ecosystems, tactical efforts such as tools and training for disinformation, and for that matter, doxing, surveillance, or other threats against democracy and freedom that are heightened in the digital space may remain useful but fall short of their transformative potential. Now, let's get a little bit into dictatorship, journalism, and the pandemic. In the Nicaraguan context, the COVID-19 pandemic became the latest factor of compounded human rights, economic and democratic crises. During and following the April uprising against Ortega in 2018, the regime used its propaganda and censorship machine to frame the massive uprising as a soft coup attempt instigated by foreign interests and to limit the distribution of quality independent journalism. After Ortega succeeded in closing virtually all civic space, to the use of the police and of paramilitary forces, as well as the weaponization of judicial and prosecutorial institutions. His regime has used this information to criminalize freedom of expression, press freedom and access to information, as well as try to create a false sense of normalcy in the country. Along its brutal police state, 
the Ortega regime has learned the ways of smart repression and censorship. For example, through the use of DDoS attacks against independent media, online harassment and propaganda through troll farms and malicious copyright takedown requests against legitimate use of public information on platforms like Facebook and YouTube. Disinformation and harassment campaigns have strong offline and online components, leveraging control of traditional media and resources for online operations to serve a single party state family narrative. This is a form of vertical integration, if you will, manufacturing truths, broadcasting them through radio and television, amplifying them through social media and hired trolls or bots and repeating as needed. Despite considerable resources and capabilities, the regime failed to convince or confuse neutrals, much less opponents, nationally or internationally. However, disinformation does play a key role in keeping a shrinking but disciplined minority of people who support the regime filled with hatred and fanaticism. These are people who are willing to kill and to die to keep Ortega in power. Enter the COVID-19 pandemic. By early 2020, it was clear that Ortega could no longer govern, but that he excelled at keeping a hold of power at any cost. Facing a public health crisis that has brought even the most capable of governments to their knees, the regime opted to deal with the pandemic through disinformation. It downplayed its severity, calling for infamous massive gatherings such as the love, love in the times of COVID parade to this day. As fanatics heeded calls to participate in such events, the pandemic's deadliness particularly among Sandinistas, has been no surprise. Doctors in public hospitals were initially ordered not to use PPE, which the government was coincidentally unable to provide anyway. Those who spoke out were fired and harassed. Citizen solidarity was criminalized. Attempts to deliver donated PPE to public hospitals were blocked by the police. The Ministry of Health sustains to this day that fewer than 200 Nicaraguans have died from COVID-19 whereas independent estimates from doctors and scientists based on shadow report and analysis are between 2,900 and 7,500 deaths. In December of 2020, Ortega's parliament passed a new cyber crimes law, which establishes fake news and whistleblowing as criminal offenses punishable by imprisonment. Among others, the law specifically targets information on public health that causes panic. So how do we do journalism in this situation? The short answer is trust and social capital. We rely on the trust of sources, many from within the regime who provide us with information at great risk to themselves. We rely on closer ties than ever between journalists and civil society that carries out shadow reporting at great peril. We rely on the trust of our audiences that continue to look to us for honest information. So looking forward, what do journalists need to keep operating in this kind of environment? and to enhance the reach and impact of their work. We can focus on technological tools or on trainings to optimize the capabilities of journalists and readers, which are important. We can focus on mitigating the negative impact of big tech platforms on the economic sustainability of quality journalism due to transformation of advertising, which is important. We can list a number of important initiatives from many different angles. Like Rocky mentioned, there's no silver bullet, but I will leave it at this. Journalists and most importantly, users need seats at the tables where communication and information ecosystems are imagined and shaped. Perhaps then the public will stop being treated as subjects in order to start being treated as agents. Thank you. Thanks so much, Enrique. Really, you know, one thing that struck me from the beginning of your, um, your remarks was sort of the historical context of misinformation, disinformation in Nicaragua dating back to the 1930s. And I think many of us, you know, most of us know that, you know, obviously this, this idea of mis and disinformation, you know, started long before, you know, the, the invention of the internet, um, you know, yellow media, gutter media, whatever you want to call it. Um, tabloid media, it's been around for a long time. And, and I think what we're all dealing with is sort of this, as Mark and you related to, was the, the speed of which this is all traveling now and in the impact um, and how it is divisive, you know, in communities, whether it's in the United States or in a place like Nicaragua. So really appreciate your, your opening comments. I want to you know, focus in right now as we get to the Q and A section, and we'll we'll get to the audience um, in a few minutes. But I just wanted to um, focus in on, on 
you know, things that all three of you, you talked about is this issue um, of journalists, supporting journalists. Um, you know, with the, the digital age, you know, we are living in the digital age. There's no question. Most of us are now getting our, our you know, our, our news from our sources through the internet, whether it's, you know, whatever newspaper you, you read. But those national, but we're getting them from national sources, whether they are CNN, Fox News here in the United States or Washington Post or, you know, whatever it is in your countries. Um, so how do we get back to, how do we um, really support local journalism for local communities so people can get those answers to local problems um, that, that, you know, that might be able to you know, mitigate this issue between national issues and local issues. And I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but it really goes back to this issue of, of supporting local journalists at the local, the local level. Um, I'll open it up to you, but maybe Enrique then Jeannie, you know, that would be, be great to hear from you guys. Yeah, so th this is very close to home in our case because we're, we're a small outlet. We have a small newsroom and we produce several products for, for TV, for, um, our website, et cetera. So Enrique, this you is want a, to just tell the audience your, your newspaper so they have a better idea. Yeah, yeah. so our outlet is Confidencial. Confidencial has a website, a print magazine, and two uh, television programs, which since 2019 have been censored on open television and cable television, and are now transmitted exclusively through YouTube and, and Facebook. So um, this, this topic is very close to home for us because we definitely have to often make decisions in terms of where our journalistic resources are assigned to. And we don't have the opportunity that we would like to have to go out of Managua, the capital city of Nicaragua, and to get more in touch with local news in different parts of the country or to build a network of, let's say, correspondence throughout the country. So we very much recognize the importance of this. We recognize the way in which trust in our information grows the more people see themselves in the stories that we tell. And that requires local journalistic capabilities, uh, which are often just one of the things that are left out in these difficult trade-offs uh, in which media outlets such as ourselves, but even bigger media outlets are consistently struggling for sustainability. So I think that this is a key issue, uh, again, an issue that there's no silver bullet for, uh, but an issue that must be resolved if uh, we're to build stronger trust and, and st stronger penetration outside of big metropolitan hubs in Nicaragua or elsewhere. Jeannie? Yeah, I'll jump on exactly that point that Enrique was making. First of all, local media is critically important. And while I do look at the Washington Post and New York Times, I live in rural Maine and the weekly packet that comes out once a week on Thursdays is critically important to me to understand what's going on in my community. And that's what everyone deserves around the world. That is the news and information that we make informed choices about our own lives on, on a daily basis. And it is the market, it, interestingly, that the rise of importance and trust in local media that has happened because of the pandemic. People are just desperate for news about when are vaccines coming to my community? What level are we at in my community? Right at that time, we've also faced a collapse in the news industry that had been growing and growing and growing, but COVID made it fall off the cliff. They call COVID an extinction event for the media, but specifically for local media. But as Enrique was saying, there are solutions. There are whole buckets of solutions, and there isn't a single one that is correct. And, and honestly, if anybody finds the business model that works perfectly for media around the world, that would be extraordinary because it doesn't exist. But there are buckets of things happening, right? I mean, the, the, the issue of consumer generated revenue where you get a loyal audience like Enrique was describing who are willing to pay for their news. That's a giant bucket is important. There is increasing philanthropic support which can never support media everywhere in the world as Rocky mentioned with the technology comes in, in investing a lot, but it's important. There is a look at state support for media. There's even some regulatory uh, action happening in the United States about sort of what, what could happen to help support local media. There are lots of challenges with that when you think about it globally and, and, and some of the governments that we're talking about, but that's certainly an element. And, and the fourth one, which we can never forget is the advertising market, the global advertising market that has fueled 
media all around the world. And while many want to sort of say it doesn't work, we give up. Well, that's not true. It's just way too big. And there are way too many opportunities to find a way to leverage that back into local media. And there's a lot of conversations happening um, within the advertising industry, within the technology industries about how uh, how we can re-leverage the, uh, the, uh, the advertising business models to support local news. So those, we have to push all of those uh, from a sustainability perspective to keep local media alive. Rocky, you also alluded to this in, in your, you know, your three buckets, this issue of, you know, supporting journalists and, you know, um, you know, facts and, and whatnot. You, you, do, you do work for, you know, a subset of, of Google, um, which, you know, I'll get to this, this other point in a second, but, you know, Google, Facebook, and, and other major tech companies have become sort of an enemy to an extent to, for many people, but at the same time, they, they're obviously, we, we need them now. Um, so you're solution oriented, you've been talking about solutions. What are some of the solutions that you're thinking about to this issue of, of local journalism and getting local news in the hands of people and, you know, maybe directing more people to their local news outlets, as, as Jeannie was saying in her local community in, in Maine, if you don't subscribe to that local entity, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, what are some solutions? I don't want to put you on the spot and say, you know, how does how do you get this this newspaper that Jeannie gets into the same hands as as the rest of her community members? But yeah, that's a great question. So um, I actually spent the better half of um, of last year uh, traveling around, um, well, not just the U.S. but the world, actually, um, interviewing um, local journalists um, and asking them if we could do more to help, what would it look like? And um, also what are their pain points specifically, not really as it relates to just doing good journalism, but specifically as it relates to countering this information. And um, I'd be happy to share sort of a very high level um, overview of kind of what we found. I mean, too long did not read, you know, when you, take misinformation down to the local level, um, you find just a, a pretty significant scale problem. You know, local newsrooms are obviously understaffed and underfunded, um, but also the existing technology that um, the local newsrooms use, um, they just don't have the scale that like, you know, the New York Times has, and they, they, they can't assemble a lot of the infrastructure required to really suss out misinformation narratives um, the way that like the Times can. So you have kind of, you know, the, the short version is they don't have the time tools and in some cases the knowledge to counter misinformation in their communities. Um, and so when we boiled it down to kind of what to what kind of tools would help local journalists and what kind of, you know, support we could provide. You know, there's obviously the, the funding question, right? Which I've already addressed and I'll, I'll put that aside because that's kind of obvious, right? Um, but to be more specific, uh, local journalists repeated, you know, quite frequently report saying, um, it's very difficult for me to track what's going viral in my communities because my, you know, my community, I just don't have the tools I need, right? So um, we actually realized that um, uh, if you could build something like, you know, a really good disinformation um, tracker that works at the local level that gives local journalists some clue that, you know, this hasn't gone viral yet, but it is at risk of going viral, like in your community, um, that would be like quite helpful, right? Um, but letting local journalists like stay ahead of the narratives um, rather than like waiting until like everyone in their community has like been overwhelmed by something, right? That's one thing that they asked for. Um, another thing they asked for was basically help tapping into local network of experts to get timely insights for local news. This basically is like, um, think of this as like, if anyone lives in New York City, there's an app that works really well there called Citizen, you know, where like it alerts, uh, it basically alerts you to like um, uh, events around you that often have to do with law enforcement or fire department or whatever. But like, if you could build, if technology could somehow be used to leverage, to, to build and create sort of a network of local experts um, that those newsrooms could then quickly tap into, um, that would be helpful. And um, the third thing we learned is just um, more tools that let journalists quickly assess the credibility of, um, of a source or a claim, basically more forensic tools. So for example, forensic tools helping um, journalists assess whether an image has been manipulated 
finding the provenance of an image using something like Google reverse image search, um, or even making it easy with sort of one or two clicks to um, learn some basic facts about a website, you know, who registered the domain, um, uh, how old is the domain, you know, things, just really simple things that like e each individual journalist like knows how to do, but when you do it over and over again, it takes up a lot of time, right? Um, so those are sort of three things. And uh, I guess a point I'll, that, that's all very US focused. Um, you know, we're a global company. Uh, we, have, we have lots of markets and, you know, and I think Enrique might be able to speak to this as well, I hope. But, you know, local news looks very different in different countries, right? Um, and um, particularly in countries where there are a lot of people that are like new to the internet or internet penetration is kind of low, um, a lot of those ecosystems just look super different than the US. So for example, I believe Kenya um, and places like that, a lot of news is in the form of text messages, like really long text message threads, right? Where it's just a big string of text. So uh, I think there's just pretty much an endless amount of work that could be done in that area to help local journalists in the formats that their users um, you know, consume. Paul, Thanks can I for... jump in and say, just sure. add to something that Rocky was saying? Uh, yeah. First of all, Rocky, it's funny when you were describing the issues, I thought you were talking about global journalists because even though the technology is different, I mean, those issues are exactly, they're very different, the technologies are, but the issues are exactly the same. But I want to go to the first one that you were talking about, about sort of, um, sort of tracking what is what, what the conversation is in a community. And we found that particularly if we think about COVID, um, uh, we work with, a lot with journalists who are covering health issues, which are really complicated and really sensitive, right? And we learned during the Ebola breakouts um, uh, in Africa, working with our partners who a lot of them were community radio journalists. And so again, the technology doesn't matter, the issue is real, that the rumors and misinformation about Ebola were just extraordinary and so, so deadly, right? That, and so we had exactly the methodology you're talking about, again, in, in a low technology way, had to come up with things that we call a rumor tracking, where we just needed to make sure and capture all the voices around what people were saying and find ways to help journalists understand what, what's being said all over. And you, you, you get in, you get uh, uh, health professionals part of that, what they are hearing as they're doing their, their, their work and things like that. So we can understand what the, the critical rumors were. Then the trick comes, and, and Rocky was also alluding to this, is how you deal with that. Because we do know that from brain science that if you repeat the rumor, you're reinforcing the rumor, right? And so you have to find different ways to address these rumors when it comes to just you know alternative coverage. The journalists have the truth sandwich where you start with the truth and then you tell the rumor and then you tell the truth again. Um, you know, there's different, there's different reporting techniques that that you need to grapple with that with. But it is, it is an it's an incredibly important tool for journalists everywhere in the world, whatever level of media, to understand what's happening in their communities. Thanks, Jeannie. I'm going to shift here a little bit because I know we have a lot of questions and I want to I want to get to as many as possible. I probably won't be able to get to all of them since we only have about 15 minutes left. So I'm going to try to do a speed round here of questions for everyone because I know, you know, we all live in the Zoom world and everyone wants their, their questions answered. So I want to get to this this first question because it came in first and it's it's very relevant. You know, we keep on talking about authoritarians within their own countries, you know, manipulating, you know, news and information for their their own constituencies. But what about um, other countries? Let's say let's use China or Russia trying to influence elections in, in other countries or, you know, the political situation in, in other countries. Um, you know, maybe Enrique, you can talk about that, you know, whether you think that there are outside forces, you know, outside of Nicaragua trying to influence what's happening on the inside. And then happy to hear from, from, from Jeannie, you know, from her inner news and, and Rocky as well. And then we'll get to some of the other questions. So I think this might be a bit of an indirect way of addressing this question. And, and I'm going to go a little bit back to the, to the historical aspect of things, just because um, during one of the things that played a key role in supporting the Somoza dictatorship, for example, from the 1930s all the way through 1979, was the fact that its hold on mass media made its propaganda so effective that it became a key sort of Cold War ally to the US in that context of uh, battles of narratives, et cetera. So I, I'm just putting that on the table because I think that it's, again, such a, you, you, may, you may have, you know, states kind of targeting other states or other societies, 
but you also have power holders within specific societies leveraging that for their own sort of geopolitical purposes. So again, I, I think it's a, for me, it's a very complex uh, situation to a certain extent. Uh, we, do, we did see that the Ortega regime tried to go international in terms of uh, delegitimizing a lot of the protests that erupted in Nicaragua in 2018, but failed to do so, largely because Nicaraguan civil society and journalism did a great job internationally of uh, documenting the truth and, and of showing the truth to the world. So I think that, uh, yes, it's, it is an issue, but perhaps uh, more of an issue for major geopolitical uh, players than for some of our smaller countries. And some, if some of our smaller countries are kind of caught in geopolitical battles, that may be a bigger issue. But maybe uh, lately Nicaragua does not really have that sort of ge uh, geopolitical uh, weight that it once may have had. And, and it's less relevant these days, I find. I'd be happy to jump in again. Sorry, I don't mean to mm -hmm. dominate every no, question, no. but I'll, I'll, I'll hold back in the future. I actually literally was just on a, another webinar this morning uh, that was looking at disinformation and misinformation and the COVID vaccine. And a researcher from George Washington University said that external players are driving misinformation, disinformation, um, such as Iran, Saudi Arabia, China, those type, you know, all around the world in, in, in big and small countries, partially to sort of bolster the reputation, like a, you know, sort of as you try to bolster your reputation as a global player in resolving the COVID pandemic by getting disinformation out there about how badly others are dealing with in countries that sort of bolsters their reputation. So we're even seeing it, not just in elections, not just in democratic practices, but also in the COVID response where external you know, players are trying to, to influence the information landscape inside other countries. Thanks, Jeannie. Um, so I'm going to continue on my speed round and I'm, I'm jumping back and forth between from different questions. I'm going to hit Rocky on this one because I think it's it's interesting as we, you know, maybe in this country, you know, I you know, school age kids around in the issue, there's always this issue with civic civic education and not enough civics in, in education. And we have a question here from from Mark, who, who is asking Rocky, can you speak to the role of education, specifically history and civics and best ways to deliver context and education? to a thirsty populace. For example, there have been several good news in quotes, you know, getting good news out there over, over the years, but the playing field remains in favor of the current landscape. Um, thank you. Yeah, I think that's a fabulous question. Um, huh, where to begin? Uh, I think the, the starting point for this conversation is um, well, I think a good conversation is to take a step back to the very beginning um, of Enrique's remarks, where he was talking about how, you know, propaganda and misinformation isn't new. Um, what is new is the speed and, and the scale of it, but also something that uh, hasn't been mentioned yet, which is the world now has mm, more or less the entirety of human knowledge at their fingertips, right? Um, that's very, that's wild. Right and very and a very different situation than we've been in in the past. And when you combine that, the, the ubiquity of of information of all kinds, high and low quality, you know, easy to consume and very difficult to consume, um, with the fact that we live in a very fragmented ecosystem where news is no longer and information is no longer um, gated by you know the the clergy or large media broadcasting organizations, but is in fact quite democratized, as was the promise of the internet. Um, people, I think, are just overwhelmed, you know, with um, a lot of, with, with, with the amount of information out there. And something I often hear when we're doing an ethnography or even when I'm speaking with family members is just the, the phrase, I don't know what to trust anymore. And I often, whenever people, they, people somehow think I know the answer, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, you know, you, you, you work for Google, you research misinformation, tell me what I should do. And I'm like, eh. you know, I wish I could. Um, but I think the answer is like, you really like don't trust anything. You verify and you, uh, you do kind of, you, you, you create really good processes and heuristics for kind of sorting the wheat from the chaff. And I think that is probably in the, in the literacy space and in the civic space, the biggest need at the moment is some sort of scaled um, lightweight curricula, if you will, 
that helps um, people of all ages, but in particular, new digital arrivals, whether they be older people who just kind of begrudgingly got online um, or people in markets that just got the internet, right? Um, helping them kind of learn a good set of habits for verifying online information. Um, and that's a tall order, you know? I mean, the scientific method is not easy, right? Um, and so I think we really have our work cut out for us there, but I I've actually been working a lot on two promising um, concepts. Um, I won't, I mean, we can go into detail later if you want, but just to be quick, I'll say one of them is an idea called um, accuracy prompts. Um, you can read about this work um, by uh, looking up uh, Dave Rand at MIT and uh, Gordon Pennycook at the University of Virginia. Um, and they basically found that like short reminders to just consider accuracy um, while you're consuming content actually is like really powerful um, because a lot of people are actually pretty good at just using their gut to sort of say, is this true? Is this not true using their prior knowledge? Um, but they just kind of get overwhelmed with information. And if you just kind of remind them like, hey, take a second, think about does this work or is this accurate? Um, you see some really positive effects there. The second concept I've been working on um, is it's called inoculation. Uh, it's a metaphor taken from, you know, like, you know, vaccines and all that. But what it really means is teaching people to identify manipulative tactics online and spot that. And when they see it, to kind of say, oh, I know what this is. This is scapegoating or this is um, logical fallacy or whatever. Um, and then, you know, seeing if that helps individuals navigate uh, misinformation a little better. Paul, if I may jump in real quick, just I think that this education issue is it, it can be really useful if we look at it also from a broader perspective. So if you analyze, let's say, the growth in terms of productivity between different parts of the global economy, you find that pretty much only the knowledge economy, sort of exemplified by big tech, um, has had these huge exponential leaps in productivity. And a lot of the rest of the global economy has stagnated in terms of productivity gains. And I think that it has a lot to do with the stagnation of education itself. So education systems now conceived for an industrial revolution kind of era uh, are just insufficient. And they're one of the reasons why the productivity gains from the knowledge economy don't spread throughout the economy. And I think that's one of the root causes of inequality in general. So if you look at it structurally, I think that education is not just a key component of a solution in terms of disinformation, but just of a lot of the structural conditions that make this information uh, so much faster and more pervasive these days. Thanks Enrique. Um, continuing with our speed round of questions because we have more than 30 questions and I'm not gonna get to all of them, but this one to Jeannie um, from a colleague at USAID. USAID, um, going back to this issue of trust in media, which is a big issue since it continues to dwindle here, at least in the United States and probably across the world. Um, you know, she asks, uh, Shannon asks, um, can you provide some examples of how programs have addressed this issue of trust in media and seen results? Yeah, I mean, for sure. The, uh, I mean, trust can be built on a number of different things. I mentioned a couple of them, that there is, the, the, the more local, the more uh, relevant the information is to people being able to make a good informed decision about their own lives helps build trust, right? The more a media is communicating with its community, we've seen this again all over the US and our US programs by teaching helping newsrooms explore new methodologies to communicate with the communities they're trying to reach, it builds loyalty, it builds trust with those news outlets. Um, we've done that through a program called the Listening Post Collective to, to, great, um, to great success for those newsrooms in garnering more sort of dedicated support. Um, also the, the issue of, of, um, of inclusion, that newsrooms that reflect the audiences that they're trying to reach, that the audiences that they serve, uh, from a gender perspective, from an ethnic and um, a religious, you know, all, all the different perspectives of the demographics of the community they serve. With that, you gain trust. And so that's an, a third element that we often, in addition to the daily, every single day, providing good, accurate information and not ever slipping with that. Because if you slip, it's really easy to lose trust and it's really hard to gain trust. Um, keeping with our theme, you know, of, um you know, authoritarianism. Um, we have a, a question about authoritarian, authoritarians 
um, leveraging micro influencers and in localizing their reach. The ability to, um, to nuance influence and unlock other languages. How can we combat this? Surely local media would be, could, would be, uh, would just easily be overwhelmed or on the worst case captured by political patronage. So I guess we're really getting to, you know, authoritarians using, you know, influencers that we all are being influenced by, not to be obvious, but, you know, that is just another way, right? Um, beyond, beyond local or beyond media, normal media that, um, you know, whether they are artists, whether they are commentators, you know, how, how can you, you deal with that situation? I have a Rocky. Go ahead. I don't want to be. No, I, I, I please go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say an, an, a different way that authoritarians influence, and, and I won't. I, I don't have a good answer for the influencers, but there's other ways when it comes to investments in infrastructure and support. There's giant investments in media and information technologies all around the world by some of the big players in the world to help influence sort of how coverage and what the local dialogue is. And so we see that as a, as a pretty big problem, uh, particularly across Africa with a lot of the other investments from China where the, the, the news and information landscape is getting built and defined by such external investments. Rocky, did you want to comment or was there? I was just going to say that I, I think this is, you know, a, a great solution to, to this problem is is actually to just restore trust in, in local journalists and local journalist institutions. I think a lot of the a lot of a lot of uh, people turn to influencers, um, you know, for information they trust out of distrust of the established institutions, right? And so, mm -hmm. um, if you win back some of that trust, you diminish the influence of some of the more malicious uh, small mm -hmm. actors out there. Um, one. One thing that Rocky, you alluded to this, and we had a question about this as well. You know, you alluded to Kenya and probably many other countries around the world, including the United States, where people are, you know, get news from WhatsApp, Signal, Telegram, and, and others. You know, just stories. Um, is that a net positive, net negative, net? What? What? You know, many of us use WhatsApp, you know, to communicate, but I know a lot of people get it for. Um, for news. So maybe Rocky, Enrique, anyway, you know, either, either of you um, maybe can address the, this proliferation of these messaging services and where people get news, because sometimes it's just easier. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. I mean, on the positive side, it brings news to a lot more people. Um, it makes news more accessible, and that's a great thing um, for, for, you know, journalism, for democracy, and for the world. On, on the negative side, I mean, it makes misinformation super hard to counter, right? Because one, these apps are almost uni uh, universally end-to-end um, -end encrypted, probably as they should be for the purpose of you know, countering authoritarian influence. Um, but it also means that there's you know, an expectation um, of end-to-end of -end privacy as well. And a lot of these conversations are basically um, extensions of you know, one's living room. And so um, to use a, an analogy that's been out there a lot. So uh, it really puts um, um, journalists and, and uh, others involved in fighting this information um, in a tough spot and really rely, relies more on um, you know, society, uh, on a societal approach to countering this information than I think uh, technology. Would. Whereas when you have people on a central platform that's kind of like a public square, um, it's a little bit easier to do things there. So very quickly on the positive side, I would also add that it brings a certain degree of closeness with the audience. Uh, that's very, that can be very important. Um, but uh, I think that ultimately from our perspective, we don't stop to think if it's a net positive or net negative, honesty. We just, we understand that it is and what can we make of it? And then just to link it to the previous question about uh, sort of authoritarians adapting. I think that we have to understand that authoritarians can adapt very easily at the strategic or tactical level. And that's why it's so important to look at these issues at the structural level. Which, you know, I know we're at the, tw the noon hour. I know we have to go in a minute. And there was one question that related to this and it maybe goes to this maybe physical structural issue. You know, the, the recent example in Uganda and so many other places where the government gets so afraid of social media that it takes it down. Um, how do we, how do you, how are we going to deal with that? Obviously the government can't take it down forever because they need it for their own 
their own uses. I'm sure you get, you get this in Nicaragua as well, Enrique, but Jeannie, you probably have a lot of experiences with partners around the world. So how do we deal with this issue of governments just shutting down the internet, shutting down electricity, you know, so people cannot communicate? How do we get around this? Is it possible? Yeah. When it first started, uh, Paul, of course, it seemed like that, that is the, that's the ultimate weapon. No one would ever do it because of what it would do to your economies, right? And yet it's proliferated. In fact, India is the number one country that shuts down the internet in a sort of very localized way. But the increase in internet shutdowns has been pretty dramatic over the last few years. So it's not it's not something that easily goes away. Some of this, there's a lot of civil society groups out there sort of advocating, obviously, against internet shutdowns. There are international standards that we're trying to pursue. There, uh, there is when you are working in an environment where it's possible is stressing exactly the issues you brought up, Paul, the economic impact, which is fundamental and so significant, the social impact, the impact on government and its ability to just do its work as well. And, and it's limited on what it's trying to control at the time. So it's a really complicated, never thought it would actually be grow so big issue, um, but it's a variety of approaches that, that, that we've seen uh, groups using all around the world. I don't know if Rocky or Enrique want to address that. It's a big question, but I think an important question. Um, but if not, um, one last thing I want to, we are, we are at, sort of at a 10 year anniversary of sort of the Arab Spring, you know, 10 years ago in Egypt in particular, where, um, you know, people were thinking Facebook and Google and Twitter and all of the media platforms and, not to beleaguer this point, but it seems like we're almost on a reverse trend and we're, we're almost blaming Twitter and other platforms as, as malign influences in, in you know, suppressing thought and, and whatnot. You know, how did we get from you know, the Twitter revolution to Twitter and, and other platforms being possibly malign influence? I hate to use that word because it's, you know, we use that in, in, with other contexts, but, um, so how do we get there from there to here? Last words, or you know, you can also just use this as your last words to 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 sum up sort of the the the, uh, the topic of this discussion today. And Jeannie, why don't we just start off with you, and then we'll we'll go through to Rocky and Enrique. Yeah, I, I think Enrique answered that question in the sense of it is it it is, and there are many good things still, and so we we need to work with it in the best way we can. And to sum up, I would say, uh, I, didn't, I didn't introduce who Internews was. We're not a news organization, despite our name. We actually help support news organizations um, all around the world, their capacity and get re getting resources to those news organizations, including the US, but again, all over the world. And I just want to salute Enrique. Really, the work that he is doing epitomizes exactly what we want to see done all around the world. We want every community, no matter how difficult it is to operate, to be able to support heroic journalists who are getting that local news and information that those communities need. So I, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, of course, Paul and the McCain Institute and, and Rocky for, for joining us. But um, uh, it's that work that this is all about. Yeah, I, th I think I'll close by answering um, Paul's question as best I can. I mean, I think, you know, all you know, there's this concept of technology curves and technology readiness and technology cycles. I think this, it's just an evolution. It's just another evolution in how humans interact with technology and each other. And I'm, I'm confident that with enough focus and, de and determination, um, we will eventually work through these issues. I mean, we've been here before, right? You can think about yellow journalism and the Spanish American war and then the rise of schools of journalism and journalism, journalism ethics and editorial boards and all of that. So I think we're just, we just need to work through these and the issues in the way we have done in the past. And I'm confident that with enough determination, um, we will. And thanks to the uh, McCain Institute again for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, so I would close by saying that how we get from the Arab Spring to now is by looking for the answers in the technology instead of in society and the structures. Um, healthy democracies require capable and empowered citizens. Healthy communication and information ecosystems require capable and empowered users. Uh, Professor Roberto Unger at Harvard often says that we are, each of us individually and all of us collectively, bigger than the social and context con contextual world that surround us. Ideas, words, laws, disciplines, technology, institutions, they're all products of our individual and collective minds. Informed citizens who are empowered to question and scrutinize are better prepared to reimagine and rebuild at a structural level. And I think that therein lies a key aspect of journalism's public value, and also of the solutions that we need against this information.
we almost lost you right there at the Enrique, but I think, you know, your words really capture what we were trying to uh, talk about today. Um, bringing back to the individual and, you know, educating ourselves and our communities um, to, to better counter, um, you know, mis and disinformation in, in our societies, you know, through finding facts and, and truth. So thank you so much, um, you know, Enrique coming from, from Nicaragua, Rocky from New York and Jeannie from, from Maine. Um, I'd encourage everyone to, to visit, you know, each of their websites, Internews, you know, it's an excellent source, you know, especially for those um, around the world for support. You know, Jigsaw does amazing work on numerous issues. You know, Rocky and his colleagues there are really on the forefront of, of you know, I would say, helping society these days. Um, encountering it. and you know people like Enrique and Confidencial, um, local journalists at their best. So we really need to support our local journalists, whether it's in Nicaragua, Maine, Washington, you know, Idaho, or any, anywhere else. So we really appreciate you um, tuning in today. You know, visit the McCain Institute website as well for more information. We also have a, a civic platform called We Hold These Truths that we hope you 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 visit as well, where we're focusing on on journalism, trust in media um, this year, as it's, you know, it's playing out to be a really, it's always an important issue, but I think today um, in our in our, con our context um, is more important than ever. So thanks so much, Jeannie, Rocky, and Enrique, and everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Bye-bye.